Thank you very much. It, it's a wonderful honor to be here, to be invited, and thank you so much to the organizers who've organized this conference so brilliantly. It's a wonderful honor, it's a wonderful excitement and it's also, and this is the very difficult part, it's also a very humbling experience. It's a very, it's been a absolutely fantastic to listen to the accounts over the last couple of days of the struggles in Rojava, in Kobani, to listen to what people are doing from, to hear it from their own mouths. Inspiring and humbling because then I think, well, what on earth am I going to say? You know, what on earth can a professor of sociology who spends his time sitting at his desk or in his seminar room, what, what, what can I contribute to those discussions? <laughs> Sorry, you weren't supposed to agree with that. And, and I think my solution in a way is to say, well, okay, I don't live, I'm not Kurdish. I'm not an indigenous peasant in Chiapas either. I'm, suppose I'm here as a kind of part of an overflowing. And perhaps we're, we are all here, or nearly all here, as part of an overflowing, that it is just not, it is not just the Kurdish struggle, marvelous as it is, but it is the fact that this struggle overflows and reaches us. It is an overflowing and we today are that overflowing. We, who are here not just to learn about them, but we are here because they are part of us and we are part of them. That I agree with. <laughs> we who are constantly being attacked and are desperate to find a way out. We who are here not just to support them, but because in them we see a hope for ourselves. We who are trying to weave a different world against and beyond the present world of death and destruction. We who are trying to weave a different world and do not know how to do it. And that is why asking we walk we walk asking, we walk learning, we walk hugging one another. We are being attacked more and more aggressively, so aggressively that sometimes it seems that we are lost in a dark night and that there will be no dawn. The Fourth World War is what the Zapatistas called it. But the name doesn't matter. Over the last few days we have heard many people 
talk about capital's war against humanity. Ayotzinapa. Ayotzinapa, Ayotzinapa is the name that resounds in the ears of all of those who live in Mexico and far beyond. Ayotzinapa, the small town in Guerrero, where 43 students who went on a demonstration six months ago were arrested and have disappeared completely. Ayotzinapa is at this moment the name that conjures up for us the horrors of the Fourth World War. But it is not just Ayotzinapa, it is not just Mexico, it is Guantanamo and the systematic torture over a period of what, 14, 15 years of people who have never been charged with a crime. It is the 300 migrants drowned, what, three weeks ago in the Mediterranean simply because they wanted to go from Africa to Europe. It is, of course, ISIS and the seemingly unending horror of war in the Middle East. It is the damage inflicted by austerity policies in the whole of Europe, in Germany as well, surely, and in Greece in particular. It is for us who live in the universities the constant attacks on critical thought. And so on and so on and so on. All symbols of the violent obscenity of a world in which money is the Lord and Master. Fourth World War then, not as a consciously planned attack necessarily, because I don't think it is that, but as the logically coherent and constantly renewed assault of money against humanity. The Fourth World War, capitalist crisis, capitalist capital desperate to survive, capital fighting by every means possible to ensure the survival of a system that makes no sense, absolutely no sense. A system that has no meaning beyond its own reproduction. The very existence of capital is an aggression. It is an aggression that says to us each and every day, today you must shape your activity in a certain way because the only activity that is recognized as valid in this society is activity that contributes to the profits of capital. In other words, you must labor. That surely is the labor theory of value, the theory that has been rather maligned and criticized over the last couple of days. It seems to me that Marx's theory of value is of fundamental importance for three reasons. Firstly, it tells us that capital depends upon the daily transformation of our activity, of our doing, into labor, into what Marx calls abstract or alienated labor, into that peculiar activity 
that creates value and ultimately profit for capital. And this dependence of capital upon converting our activity in labor, first of all, announces the weakness of capital, that it depends on us. And it also tells us that the struggle against capital is necessarily the struggle against labor, and that is to say the struggle for the emancipation of human activity. And that is surely what a, a centr that surely is a central part of the movement in Kurdistan. Secondly, the labor theory of value tells us that the conver conversion of our activity into labor is a totalizing process that subordinate, subordinates us all to a centralizing logic, the logic of profit. And that tells us already that revolution must be an unraveling of that logic that if capital is a process of totalization, then revolution must be a detotalizing process, an autonomizing process, a creation of a world of many worlds, as the Zapatistas put it. And thirdly, the labor theory of value tells us that this drive to convert our activity has a dynamic, a dynamic that derives from the fact that the magnitude of value is measured by the labor, the amount of labor that is socially necessary to produce a commodity, and the fact that this amount of time is central, is constantly falling. In other words, Capital's weakness is not only to depend that it depends upon, the conver our, on, upon converting our activity into labor, but it depends upon making us go faster, faster, faster. Faster, faster, faster is the central, pro central dynamic of capital, a dynamic that becomes more obvious with every day that passes, as passes. And with this faster, 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 then the inherent weakness of capital becomes a tendency to crisis. Marx's theory of labor, Marx's theory of labor, Marx's labor theory of value, sorry, is a scream a scream of pain and fury against the obscenity of organizing our activity in this way. But it is also a cry of hope that this system that is destroying us has a fatal weakness, the fact that it depends upon us. Labor then, and I go into that, I suppose, because of the discussion over the last couple of days in which it seemed to me that Marx's labor theory of value was really being presented in a way that went, goes completely against what Marx was actually saying. So labor is the production labor for Marx capitalist labor is the production of meaningless. David Graeber said it beautifully yesterday. Marx said it also beautifully 150 years earlier. Labor is the production of meaningless, but it is not just the production of meaningless, it is the production 
of death and destruction, the destruction of humanity and the destruction of non-human forms of life. Capital is aggression, and in this aggression there is an intensification, in, in, in its crisis there is an intensification of that aggression. In the present crisis, capital comes up against the limits of its ability to impose the logic of profit the faster, faster, faster. It comes up against our humanity. We are the crisis of capital. We are the crisis of capital. And that seems to me fundamental for thinking how we can get out of it. Capital tries to find a solution to its crisis in two ways. First, by pushing harder, by becoming more authoritarian, by pushing out of the way all who stand as an obstacle to its valorization. Ayotzi Napa, the 50 political prisoners in the state of Puebla where I live. And secondly, Capital tries to find the solution by playing a game of make-believe, a game of let's pretend. If we can't exploit you the way we need to, let's pretend that we can. Let's create a world of credit and debt. Let's expand the banks. Let's expand finance capital. But the crisis of 2008 announces clearly the limits of that game of make pretend so that capital is forced to become even more directly authoritarian to try and ensure its own meaningless survival. Fourth World War, war against humanity. And we have to win this war we have to win this war because to lose it is to accept the possible annihilation of human life. And by winning the war, by winning the war, I mean not or not just stringing the bankers and the politicians up from the nearest lamppost, however attractive that may seem. But by winning the war, I mean that we have to stop the war, that we have to break the dynamic of capital. It seems to me there are basically two ways that are being thought of at the moment in terms of winning the war. One strategy, the strategy that is generally considered realistic, is we will get rid of capital by reproducing capital. I think the problems of Bolivia, Venezuela, and the present crisis in Greece suggest that this is a difficult thing to achieve. The struggle, the other thing is that with Greece, if we push it off onto the state, we are in fact delegating our responsibility. And this is something so serious that we cannot delegate our responsibility. We cannot delegate it to the governments. We cannot delegate it either to the Kurds or to the Zapatistas. It is something that we ourselves have to assume. The struggle is ours here now in Hamburg or wherever we live. Wherever we live and not just wherever we were born or wherever our parents happened to be born. Though of course that is an important part of where we live and how we live. We are in the center 
the contradictory we, the we who walk asking, the we who walk dreaming, above all the we who walk weaving, weaving the basis of a different society. We push against capital by doing against labor, by weaving a world of many worlds that push towards self-determination, all of them contradictory, all that come to f have to come face to face with the complex problem of their interface of the world still ruled by money. There is a poetry Oops, sorry, I'm getting nervous about time. Um, basically, what I want to say is, look, we've got these two approaches, okay? One appears to be the realistic approach. We vote in a left government. What we're seeing at Greece, I agree, agree completely with what Dimitri said this morning, that we must demonstrate our solidarity with the Greek people, but we must also see that the process at the moment in Greece is a dramatic illustration of what can be achieved through the state. The other strategy is to say, no, really to hell with the state. I mean, that's what we've all been saying one after another. We have to assume the responsibility ourselves. We have to live now the world that we want to create. We have to live now the world that is not yet. We have to struggle prefiguratively. Lots of times this sort of struggle is dismissed as being, oh, that's very nice, it's so poetic, so romantic, but it's not very realistic, is it? And I think precisely now in these days with the crisis in Greece, the tables are being turned. And we're seeing that the realism of the state approach is totally unrealistic. And that the only thing we're left, uh, the only thing we're left with is in fact the prefigurative struggle to to, to, to create a world, uh, to, to create now the world that does not yet exist. Is this realistic? We do not know. We know that no other approach will work. We know that it's desperately necessary, but we are not sure that we can win. We are betting on a possible future. We are betting on the creation of a different world. The we fight by weaving a different world in many different ways. These are weavings that are taking place in all the world. Weavings that are constantly threatened by capital frequently crushed by capital, constantly taken up by us again. The weaving this weekend in this Audi Max is part of that process. There is no model, there are no rules as to how it should be done, but there are outstanding examples there are beautiful fireworks that light up the sky of this dark night. The Zapatista struggle is, of course, one glorious example of that. And as we have heard in such inspiring detail over the last couple of days, the struggle of the Kurdish freedom movement is another glorious example that gives us hope. Thank you for being here.